on December 20th, 1974, Chris was eight years old. It was the last day of school before Christmas break and they just let out early at noon for the holiday. He'd ridden the bus and he'd gotten off the bus and he's walking the, the half length of the block to his house that's in the middle of the block. And while he was walking home, there was a man he did not know walking toward him. And the man said, you must be Hugh Carrier's boy. You look just like your daddy. And Chris was so proud that that man could see his father's resemblance in him. He said, he called, the man called his mother by the nickname that she has known only in the circles inside the family. And he said to Chris, I'm preparing a party for your father. Would you like to come and help me decorate? And eight-year-old Chris said, sure. And he turned around and began walking with the stranger. They got to the end of the block and got in this stranger's motor home and he began to drive Chris out of town. Chris said he got nervous when he began to not see familiar landmarks, but the man put him at ease and said, I've missed my turn. Let me stop the motor home. And here's a map. Would you look and see if you can help me find the right street? And while Chris was looking at the map, he said he felt a sharp pain in his back and he turned around to see the man holding an ice pick. And that man stabbed Chris over 20 times in the chest with an ice pick. He fell down in the motor home and that man drove them into the deep part of the Everglades and took Chris outside and shot him in the head at point blank range with a pistol and left him there to die. For six days and nights, Chris Carrier's family agonized about their lost child having no idea where he was. For six days and nights, he lay in the Everglades unconscious with no protection from the elements or the animals and miraculously after six days and nights he woke up and eight years old thought I'm missing the party and so he made his way back to the street there in the middle of the Everglades he could have been there for any period of time without seeing anyone miraculously a hunter and his two sons drove up at just that moment. They saw this little boy that looked like he had two black eyes and had beaten up. They took him in. They got him to the hospital. They found out there that the bullet, when it went through his head, had pierced his left optic nerve, leaving him blind in his left eye for the rest of his life. After a couple of weeks of recuperation, the police brought in a sketch artist. And Chris was able to describe his assailant. And his father and his uncle immediately recognized the man as someone they had hired to be a caretaker for their great uncle after his stroke and whom they had to fire six months earlier for negligence in his work. His name is David McAllister. The police went out to McAllister's house. They found the motor home the way Chris described it. They found a pistol of the same caliber. But in 1974, the forensics couldn't positively match to the crime and Chris couldn't provide a positive identification of his assailant in person. He was never convicted. Move the story forward. His family's a part of the University Baptist Church in Coral Gables, Florida, where Missy's dad was the pastor. At 13, Chris made a profession of faith, and in the course of his growing in his faith, he decided the only way he could live his life not being afraid of the past and afraid that someone somewhere wanted him dead for a reason he didn't know why was to forgive and let go and cling to God instead. Move the clock in your mind forward 22 years from 1974. It's now 1986. Chris is a college graduate, a seminary graduate. He's married and has two daughters. He's just gotten a job as the campus minister at San Marcos Academy. He's about to move from Florida to Texas. And there was a retired police officer who had been assigned to his case as a child who's now working in the nursing home in Florida. And he recognized David McAllister as Chris's assailant. Now, blind from glaucoma and bedridden with age, this retired policeman convinced McAllister to confess to his crime. And he called Chris and asked him, Would you like to confront the criminal who created so much havoc in your life? And Chris came to the nursing home. The policeman thought he'd want to strike him, and he was prepared for that, was really open to that. Chris came and delivered in person the forgiveness that he had offered in his heart those years ago. 
I forgive you. I forgave you years ago. You tried to take something from me, but I have chosen to look on my life as a miracle. A miracle that the stab wounds didn't kill me. A miracle that the bullet didn't kill me. A miracle that the elements didn't kill me. A miracle that the animals didn't kill me. A miracle that someone found me. I've chosen to decide that God is blessing my life and has more in store for me. And now there's nothing left between us except the possibility of a friendship. Chris came back the next day. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, for seven days, every day, Chris Carrier came to visit David McAllister in the nursing home, offering his forgiveness and sharing his faith until he led David McAllister into a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why forgive? Forgive for God's sake. Forgive for what God might do through the other and for the world. Forgive for your own sake. Why forgive so that when the gospel happens to you, it can happen through you? Well, would you pray with me? Gracious God, give us the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit and the example of your Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus, to forgive as we have been forgiven. And give us the joy of seeing the compounding effect of grace when we give it in your name and offer it in the world. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name.